like to read a very well-known passage. Just a couple verses. Matthew 28, right near the end. Oftentimes these verses are called the Great Commission. And this is the context. Jesus has risen. He has spent some days on earth interacting with his disciples and with others. And now he is preparing to go back into heaven. We call that the ascension, when Christ ascended back into heaven. And these are the final words, according to the Gospel of Matthew, Christ's final words on earth, final instructions to his disciples. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, if you've ever been uh, to any kind of missions conference, you've probably heard sermons preached on this passage. And generally in that context, the four verbs that are included here, one of those is emphasized, and that's usually the verb go. Go, because it's missions, right? So we're going. We've got to go and make disciples. Um, in more recent times, more emphasis has been added to the other verbs, make and teach. Go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. But of these four verbs, go, make, baptize, and teach, I suggest that one of them is most consistently either left out completely or at best underemphasized. Can you guess which one that might be given that we're celebrating baptisms this morning? It's the verb baptize. In these verses, what we actually see is Christ encapsulating for his disciples what discipleship looks like. So he says to those nearest him, go, and as you go, make disciples. So that's great. That's the command, make disciples. But then in just two simple phrases, he gives a picture of what that should look like, of the how. How do we make disciples? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that he's commanded. Now, implied here is that belief in Christ is foundational. That's the first requirement for discipleship. Because a disciple is a disciple of someone. They're not just disciples of nothing. So an individual who takes on this path, who enters the path of discipleship, by definition, is entering a path of belief in Jesus Christ. But then how does that path continue? What does Jesus say? Make disciples and baptize them. Two implications here. One implication for those who are doing the disciple making. And by extension, friends, we have to understand that really is a call for every disciple. So everyone who is a believer in Christ, you and me, we are called to make disciples. We should be involved in one way or another in making of other disciples. The second implication, though, is going to be for those who are newer or younger on their discipleship path or on their discipleship journey. What are those implications? First of all, baptism is not optional. And I think that's a little bit shocking for us in 2016 to hear that in the evangelical church today. But Christ does not present baptism to his disciples as an option. He presents it to them as the necessary step in discipleship following salvation. That salvation and belief in Christ will flow naturally and rightly into the step of baptism. We have, and by we I mean the evangelical church, at least in the West for a number of generations, have treated baptism more and more as an option. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to do. We should all do it, you know. Uh, if you get around to it, if you remember it, you know, if you're graduating and you're about to leave home and maybe go on to college, you know, and you haven't done it yet, it's a good thing to do. But I think we have 
failed to understand this as a command, as something that is ordained from the mouth of Christ himself. Those of you who are disciples, those of you who have entered that path, baptism lies on that path. And you must take that step into baptism. So the implication for those who are discipling or making disciples is that we need to do all we can to guide those, to lead those new disciples toward baptism. And for those who are new on their walk, who are perhaps more recently engaged upon this path of discipleship, the implication to you is that this is a necessary step. Now, there's not a particular timeline in this, and it's, it, it should not be, it can't be something that is forced or demanded, but it is of you an act of obedience and surrender. It's something that Jesus very clearly ordained. All analogies fall short. We understand this. Every analogy at some point or another falls short. But perhaps we can think of the Christian life as a giant skyscraper. And the goal of this life is to see that skyscraper built and brought to completion. But where does it start? A skyscraper starts with the foundation. And as with any structure, the foundation is the most important, the most crucial. Without it, nothing else will be built and nothing else will rise. And perhaps we can think of that foundation as salvation. That's the belief in Christ Jesus. That's the surrender to him. That is saying, Jesus, I am a sinner and I accept, I accept your sacrifice for my sin in my place. And I repent and I give my life to you. That's salvation. It's separate from baptism. It's different from baptism. The two are related, but baptism is not salvation. So that salvation, that's that foundation upon which everything else is going to be built. And you know what? No one intentionally builds a foundation and then abandons it. Now, I realize this is a bad time to be making this analogy here in Sao Paulo and in Brazil because given the economic crisis, this has happened a lot. And so you might see a number of uh, big construction projects where there's only a foundation and nothing else, and it's been abandoned. If you want an example, just go down and look at the monorail down on uh, Roberto Marinho over here. Um, but that's not something that happens intentionally. I don't think anybody plans that. Hey, I, you know what? You know what I want to do with my life? I'm just going to build foundations. I don't want to build anything on top of them. I just want to build foundations. No, none of us do that. No one does that, at least not intentionally. So as we have gained, have received that foundation who is Christ in a relationship with him, he invites us to build on that foundation. And one of the next steps of building is baptism. The moment when a believer, a disciple, stands before God and before the church and publicly states through baptism, I identify with Jesus. And at that, as that public statement is made, God mysteriously and miraculously ministers the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to his disciple. You've heard me use this verse many times in relationship to baptism. Paul makes it very clear in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It's also entirely possible that many of us might not get it. So you look at baptism and you say, what's the big deal? That makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't think I need it. I definitely don't understand it. It seems to be mildly embarrassing to be the only wet person in a room of dry people. I can take a bath just as easily and much more privately at home. And so we, we say, because we don't understand it, or because we don't feel a need for it, that therefore, it's not essential. 
But friends, that's not a call that we can make. We don't have the freedom to make that call because baptism has been ordained by Christ, not by us. On Friday, I took uh, our car to the mechanic because it was making an odd noise. So I drove around and, uh, with the mechanic, and, and he told me what he thought the problem was. Oh, you know, it's probably, uh, <clears throat> this is what he said. It's probably the coxinha. I think that's what he said. I didn't know a car had a coxinha. The only coxinhas I know of are at the padaria on the corner. <laughs> and he said that to me, and you know what I did? I said, oh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Deve ser a coxinha mesmo. You know, it must be, must be the coxinha. Ah, that makes sense. You know, I, I suppose it makes sense. I do really trust my mechanic, by the way, and there is partly this analogy reflects that, you know, that, that we, we trust God who has ordained baptism to us, even if we do not understand it. In the same way that I trust my mechanic who says that my car has a problem with its little chicken drumstick, and I don't, I have no idea what that means, but you know what? I said, okay, you know what? I, you're, you're right. It's probably the coxinha, so why don't you go ahead and, why don't you go ahead and fix it? You know what? I left it there for a few hours. You bought the car back. The car's fine. Sounds good. Doesn't make the noise anymore. It's running well. Uh, I don't understand what he did. I don't understand how he did it. I, if I went to a car parts store, I wouldn't even know how to buy a coxinha. The guy would say, well, for what car? What is it? I don't know. It's what I need. And even if I had a coxinha, the right kind, even with a YouTube instructional video, I would not be able to change it on my car. I promise you. We submit to the Lord in baptism because he has ordained it whether we understand it, whether we feel the need for it or not, we follow him in this obedience. Friends, baptism is a gift, but it is also a command. So let us not take it lightly, nor let us despise it, but let us embrace it. Let us submit to Christ in baptism. And today, let us celebrate with those who are taking this step. As a church, we believe that baptism is for those who already believe in Christ. As I said earlier, those who are already saved and they are continuing their path of discipleship and they are following God in this path of obedience. And part of that process is that we ask those who are being baptized to share their testimony of faith with the church so that we as a body can be encouraged and we can affirm with them their obedience of baptism.